And now I would like to welcome our next speaker, Sebastian Ruda. <laughs> welcome to the stage and another uh, warm welcome. <laughs> Sebastian is a, a senior research scientist at Google and he, his main focus is on language processing as well as machine learning and uh, deep learning. And uh, now I'm curious to learn a bit more about scaling NLP to the world's languages with its challenges and opportunities. And yeah, now it's your stage. <laughs> uh, thanks so much and hello everyone. It's my pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Uh, oh yeah, awesome, thank you. And yeah, I think we actually have a good, good segue from the previous talk, um, because my talk mainly is going to be about how we can unlock the benefits of language technology in general and of large language models in particular, not only for um, English or um, a few European languages, but for most of the world's languages. Um, so the main question at the heart of my talk is how we can make the current NLP systems and current models that we have available um, accessible and useful to the speakers of um, the next thousand languages in the world. And just to give you a bit more, more context um, on that, uh, if we look at the next 400 languages or the top um, 400 languages with most speakers in the world, um, all of these have more than one million speakers. And going beyond that, if we look to the next 1,200 languages with most speakers, each of those languages still has more than 100,000 speakers. So we are by far, even though a thousand languages sounds like a huge amount, we are by far not talking about small languages, but all of these have very large speaker communities and potential uh, users or customers that we might be, um, that we could serve with our language technology. And ultimately, uh, looking at these 1,000 languages in total, uh, these make up about 3 billion um, speakers that are currently underserved or that are not able to use uh, existing um, technology as it is currently available today. Um, and for a bit more broader context, traditionally um, research in natural language processing, NLP, has been typically done in English, uh, because in English um, it's a language of science and it's typically where most of the data uh, was easiest to create and uh, to annotate in practice. And this picture, um, this was the case uh, 10 years ago and hasn't changed dramatically, even if you look at recent literature um, in the field that uses deep learning and machine learning based approaches. Um, there's um, kind of a more recent trend that um, trains these large language models that you've already heard about um, before um, in an increasing number of languages in a multilingual setting. Um, and these models you can think of are basically um, kind of analogous to models that are only trained on English, like GPT-3. Um, now, um, instead of th just training them on a single language like English, these are being trained on around 100 different languages, typically on data from the web or on Wikipedia. Um, and to give you a bit of sense of how progress in this area of training these large-scale multilingual models have looked like, um, you can see here the performance on a, a benchmark that we proposed in uh, 2020 for assessing the generalization ability of these large-scale multilingual models. And as is the case with um, a lot of recent research in NLP on training and pre-training these large models, um, we typically want to evaluate them not only on a single task or a single application, but on benchmarks that cover uh, many different tasks, many different capabilities at the same time. Uh, so, this, so the numbers that you see here are basically the average over nine different tasks, and with each task covering um, a number uh, among a set of 40 dif different languages. Um, and here, um, if you just look at this picture, we can generally see quite an, an optimistic or promising trend in that we've seen kind of from the earliest uh, large-scale multilingual models, uh, like multilingual birds, which were basically just multilingual extensions of models that were very successful um, for English. Um, we can see kind of steady improvement um, on this benchmark, getting edging ever closer to human-level performance, or at least performance achieved by human annotators on these very specific uh, down stream task for natural language processing. Um, so just by looking at this um, figure of progress, we might be able to, uh, or we might speculate that we might be getting close to actually training very well-performing and uh, training multilingual models that will actually be useful and beneficial for many languages of the world. 
Um, however, um, just looking at this um, average really um, provides only a distorted picture of progress um, because many um, of the tasks that are available in this benchmark um, only uh, and uh, in this benchmark as well in most data sets that are used in NLP research and practice only cover very few languages among them. Um, so here you can see on the right side the uh, language coverage of many standard data sets on the top um, with uh, the 40 languages of this benchmark on uh, shown with each row. And you can see that uh, only for a few tasks you actually have green green cells, uh, meaning that this language is covered by the data set um, for a few of the data sets, with most languages actually not being uh, being covered by only one or two of these data sets. So just by looking at kind of the performance on existing data sets or benchmarks, um, we, uh, we can only tell that we are doing um, pretty well and we are training models that can do well on languages with uh, large amounts of resources like English or like other European languages or Chinese. Um, but we can make a much uh, weaker statement about um, most of the world's other languages with which have much less data available to date. And specifically, if we look at languages with a lot fewer data, such as measured in terms of the number of Wikipedia passages, um, which is um, kind of a standard resource for training these large-scale models, we can see, um, again, here mostly red, so most data sets actually do not even cover um, most of these languages. Um, and so taking a step back from these uh, multilingual models and looking at them in uh, relation to perhaps the mainstream of NLP research, which focuses on um, training or utilizing um, large-scale models that were trained in English, um, you can see here on this diagram basically um, the um, representative recent models, both multilingual and trained on English, in terms of the fraction of non-English training data that was used when pre-training them. So the multilingual models will be very much at the top because most of the data is um, going to be in other languages and only a small subset of the training data may be in English, while most of the English-based models are going to be at the bottom because either they are exclusively trained on English or only cover a little bit of data in other languages. And so you can see here models like GPT-3, that was mentioned uh, before, but also more recent models like Lambda or Palm from Google, um, which fall under this uh, more English-centric category. Um, so in general, you can really identify basically two streams of current NLP research, uh, models that are um, particularly and dedicatedly trained um, in this multilingual setting, and the mainstream of more English-centric models. And um, so far, unfortunately, or um, I think the unfortunate observation here is that um, even the more recent and as models have grown larger, they have not really become more inclusive of the world's languages. So they're still mostly um, overly focused on English, even for the largest recent models. And for the, for the remainder of the talk, I want to outline a couple of um, opportunities and challenges to hopefully over time um, as a community, both in research but also in application, that we can um, consolidate these two research streams on pre-training large models so that we can ultimately um, not, or not train models just for English and specific models for other languages, but can, that we can uh, train models that are able to serve uh, 100 or even the next 1,000 languages with the same model. Um, and on that note, in terms of uh, talking about challenges and on opportunities, kind of the main facets I think that are generally important uh, when talking about these uh, settings in machine learning in, and AI in general um, regard kind of the models and the architectures we want to build, um, but also the data that we want to feed uh, into these models. And specifically on the modeling side, I'm going to be talking about training more um, computationally efficient models and also models that cover and span multiple modalities. Um, while on the data side, I want to emphasize the importance of um, evaluating on real-world relevant data um, and covering data that includes uh, different language varieties. Um, so on the computational efficiency side, um, 
I've talked so far um, about these languages having little amount of data in practice uh, available. Um, so often these languages are also referred to as low resource uh, languages um, because they have few data sets that are machine readable and that are available for training uh, with current models. Um, but in practice, the, the settings where we would like to apply uh, models or use applications that will be able to serve speakers of these languages also typically have other constraints. So for instance, as you can see on this uh, diagram here, um, the cost of mobile data is um, very different across different countries, and particularly for um, kind of poorer countries or countries in Africa, um, there is a comparatively higher cost of mobile data, which makes it difficult, for instance, to deploy larger models um, on devices or um, perform on-device computing as well. Um, so in order to really um, preserve these languages, we must need uh, and serve these languages, we must be able to take these um, computational constraints into account as well. And the overall direction of um, just training larger and larger models, um, even though these may be useful for some applications, um, ultimately like uh, having a model that uh, contains uh, 1 trillion or 10 trillion parameters, even though that might be very multilingual in the end, might not actually be able to be useful for actual customers in the real world. Um, so on this note, um, I really um, think as a community and in general, we need to work on um, designing and training models that are more efficient um, along different dimensions. Um, and in particular, efficiency both comes in um, being more efficient in terms of the data that we are feeding into the models and um, uh, that we can use for training these models, because in practice, trying to annotate or obtain data for um, up to a thousand languages is uh, very expensive or even infeasible in practice, particularly looking at different practical applications. So we really need to design models that can uh, learn with a very few data as possible. And here, it can be uh, become increasingly important to try to incorporate inductive biases into the models. So even though in, in general, kind of in NLP and in ML in general, um, the trend really has been going towards uh, making models as general as possible. So from recurrent models that still have kind of this recurrency biases, we've moved to transformers, which are um, much more general function approximators and which can learn much more complex relations from just data directly. And we've seen the power of these models when you feed into them uh, millions or billions of token of training data, the amazing feeds and capabilities that they can acquire by being provided with huge amounts of data. Um, but because we, we do not have access to huge amounts of data for most of the world's languages, um, we actually need to enco uh, encode and incorporate more prior knowledge into these models again. And here, just to highlight one, um, uh, one potential example, you can see at this table the um, tokenization or the segmentation that kind of a state-of-the-art model assigns to the word excitement in different languages. Um, and typically, these models like BERT or uh, GPT-3 as well have a subword-based component um, uh, as an initial input preprocessing step that splits input words um, kind of based on a frequency model that it has learned previously from large amounts of data. Um, and you can see here that for more, um, words like excitement in English that might be um, represented very often in the data because English language data is typically quite overrepresented, um, the model might um, assign a single word uh, to that word in its vocabulary. Um, but for other um, words that occur uh, less in the data, like for from different European languages or languages that um, have more morphemes, these words might be split along different boundaries that, again, the model has learned based on frequency. And in practice, most of these, if you look, for instance, at the, at the German word, might uh, not actually really um, consist with actual morphology or with how you would intuitively try to split this word into its different uh, co components or morphemes. Uh, so here, we, and this is even a larger problem for languages that are um, morphologically rich, like many in Africa or Southeast Asia as well, where we simply do, don't have a lot of data and where these segmentation models are much uh, less accurate too. 
Um, secondly, talking about space efficiency, um, I've mentioned that pr these huge models are simply not, not useful, not practical for many of these settings. So trying to uh, learn language-specific parameters um, is, I think, quite an important direction in this area. And as one potential approach, um, there is this paradigm of using adapter layers, um, which you can kind of see in illustration of here, uh, which are basically small bottleneck parameters um, consisting simply of a feed-forward, uh, down and an up projection. Um, that are added to an existing pre-trained model. And the nice thing about these parameters is that you can keep the entire parameters of the pre-trained model fixed and only learn these very small amounts of additional parameters. Um, uh, so in practice, if you want to have a model that can perform well on different tasks, you only need to store a single copy of this pre-trained model and um, only a small set of additional adapted parameters. Um, and finally, in terms of time efficiency, we also need um, more efficient uh, models that are uh, more that have lower latency and can perform uh, faster at inference time or also doing training. Um, the other aspect I want to emphasize is uh, the need for multimodality. If we look towards the, um, the next thousand languages, um, the data that we've mostly been using so far to training these um, multilingual and uh, monolingual models for English and other languages is data from the web or from Wikipedia, all in the form of text. Um, but looking at the next thousand languages, um, most of these are actually um, not available or have very little web presence. Uh, Wikipedia itself only covers around 300 languages and about a similar number are represented on data on the internet as well. Um, so these languages, however, are by no means data poor. The data is just in different formats that we so far have been uh, avoiding or ignoring in terms of processing it with our models. Um, so the data for these languages might be contained in handwritten documents, in books that so far haven't been digitized, in lexicons that contain translations to other languages, or in completely different formats. Uh, many languages have vibrant radio stations and a lot of different radio stations in their country, um, as well as strong communities and other platforms like YouTube online. Um, and for instance, you can see here just some examples of different YouTube music videos in um, uh, some of these next thousand languages. Um, and in addition, for many languages as well, it's more common to actually uh, speak them, to write, uh, to write in them. Uh, maybe people have not grown up with uh, using computers or using smartphones, or um, the, the countries might have little internet penetration, or many of these languages might also have non-standardized orthographies. So the way things are uh, spelled might vary from speaker to speaker, so people generally um, prefer the spoken word. Um, so in general, in order to make progress really for um, these next thousand languages, we really need not only to train models that are multilingual, but also multimodal, and that are, that are able to use data from these diverse range of different sources. Um, and just to highlight the current um, two kind of current approaches or di directions in this area, the first approach is training, um, kind of jointly training text and speech models. Um, so both using kind of huge amounts of uh, unlabeled text data from Wikipedia and from the web, but also at the same time using speech data from YouTube or other sources that are available, um, kind of in the uh, unsupervised setting here, um, as well as uh, using kind of labeled data that is available for uh, for training ASR models, kind of in a in a joint fashion in this multimodal setting, um, and to go hand in hand with these multilingual multimodal models, we also need new benchmarks that are um, able to evaluate text and speech models across different languages, um, and that cover many different languages as well. And here's just one example of a recent uh, benchmark that we worked on at Google that um, covers uh, these multimodal text and speech-based models, uh, where the benchmark itself covers around 100 different languages in its component tasks, and covering things like um, speech recognition, but also um, speech translation, for instance. Um, the third aspect I want to highlight here, and one kind of limitation of the uh, current existing evaluation landscape um, that these models are being evaluated in, is uh, the frequent use of translations for evaluating multilingual models. Because um, obtaining actual natural language text in many languages at scale is very difficult and very expensive. Um, existing um, data set creators typically resort to using translation, uh, so translating an existing English uh, data set to a wide range of different languages. 
Um, and in practice, this has a number of different side effects. The first one being um, that the language that is produced through translation, which is known as translationese, actually differs in many subtle and not so subtle aspects from what is uh, uh, more regularly known as natural language, so language that is kind of uh, uttered and produced by speakers kind of in a natural environment. Um, so if we evaluate on um, data sets that are only produced uh, through translation, we're actually not able to get a uh, really completely accurate reflection of how these models would fare in the real world. Um, and the additional and I think perhaps bigger issue is that by tra translating existing data sets, um, these data sets inherit the biases in the viewpoints and perspectives that are encoded um, by the people who created the original English-based data, which are typically um, crowd workers based in the US or other uh, English-speaking countries. So these data sets uh, might actually not reflect the, the concepts, the, the queries, or the areas of interest that are actually relevant and important to the speakers of these other languages. Um, so in order to really um, make progress for, for training and actually deploying um, re, uh, models that can be useful and relevant in the real world to um, actual speakers, we also need to be able to design uh, challenging data sets that are practically relevant um, for evaluation in these different languages. Um, and here in particular, I want to emphasize, because um, again, uh, it's simply not feasible for a single company or a single entity to annotate data in a, in a thousand languages. Um, potentially, um, so we really need to be able to build and work more closely with um, local speaker communities and particularly researchers and practitioners that are working and natively speaking those languages and work with them more closely in, in actually um, building these uh, resources that are relevant um, in, in their local context. Um, and the other aspect is um, for the speakers and the annotators that we have available, we also need to design more effective and efficient means to actually use their expertise and their language knowledge for annotation. Um, uh, because for many, uh, for many languages, it's very difficult to find annotators in practice, and there may only be very, very few annotators that we might have access to. So we really would like to maximize um, the, the benefit that we can gain from using the time. And here, in particular, um, there are both strategies like active learning, um, but given kind of the um, capabilities of large-scale models, which can also uh, generate different forms of data, uh, we can imagine kind of different human and AI collaborative uh, designs to kind of jointly annotate um, data where the AI model might propose different, uh, different ways or different um, uh, topics for generating the data that might be further refined by human annotators. Um, and lastly, the, the final aspect that I want to highlight is um, not just looking at languages as monoliths, as kind of independent um, single entities that are, cap uh, that are separate and do not relate to each other, but thinking of languages more as a continuum um, and as something that uh, is maybe also in practice not often not very clearly defined. So, um, uh, uh, kind of a famous quote is that language is just a dialect with an army and a navy. Uh, so in practice, languages are most often um, a, a product of uh, the socio-political environment, um, and many um, uh, uh, many um, varieties that are not considered as separate languages uh, are still spoken by tens of millions of speakers, like different varieties of Chinese, uh, for instance, which are not considered and not treated uh, currently separately in existing research, but which have uh, by themselves speaker communities that rival many other languages, uh, like the ones we have in Europe here. And similarly, um, Portuguese as well. Portuguese is typically um, treated uh, as like as a single language as well, even though uh, Portuguese Portuguese as spoken in Portugal and Brazilian Portuguese are very different as well. And you would really like to have, um, and Brazilian Portuguese speakers in particular, would really like to have systems that can actually uh, serve and deal with their, their particular variety of Portuguese. And this extends to more uh, local and other forms of dialects, which also have uh, large amounts of lexical variation among them, such as for Indonesian languages. Um, so here again, we don't really, um, ultimately I think the goal should be that we don't want to force users to adopt a variety or um, like a perceived standard setting of a language they may not be completely comfortable with, or that may not actually be the language they would prefer speaking in, but that we would try to meet them actually uh, where they are in the language that they really 
feel most comfortable speaking um, and in the kind of most relevant setting to them. And on that note, um, I think there's still, particularly in this area, a lot of, um, a lot of improvements and a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, as a first step, we can think of um, simply making such information about dialect and styles and other registers more easily available um, in current data sets. And beyond that, um, so for instance, um, here's a table with some information about uh, d d uh, written uh, language variation for different um, local Indonesian languages, um, which have uh, very different uh, standardized orthographies. Um, and ultimately, we should really aspire to train models that are um, robust to different language varieties, not only when we feed um, data in different languages or language varieties into them, but that can also generate data in different varieties, such as for translation or if you want to converse with a dialogue assistant, for instance. Um, so with that, I just want to um, end here again with these four kind of tenets or, I think, important directions that I outlined. And I hope I was able to give you kind of a sense a bit of where current research is at um, in this area of multilingual NLP and um, about yeah, some of the areas that we still need to make progress in. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> really, really interesting. Uh, I always love when, when something that seems natural uh, becomes so technical so that you uh, yeah, try to uh, analyze uh, a language. And uh, I was just wondering where does the original idea come from that you started scaling NLP in the words language? What, what was the, the origin? Was it does it come from chatboard or um, conversational AI or uh, coding um, language or where does this come from? Um, you mean my, like my, my personal interest in this direction or, or generally in kind ge of this research? Generally, yeah. when you know, when you know yeah. it. <laughs> um, sure, I mean, uh, I, I, well, I think it's quite a, a natural um, setting. Um, I, maybe I think the, the earliest traces that you can trace that to might be to the Cold, Cold War, which is where um, kind of a lot of uh, like machine translation technology had its beginnings, um, uh, being able, uh, trying to decipher uh, like Russian messages, uh, which led kind of to the first developments of like very, very basic then um, English-Russian um, kind of translation systems. And yeah. so ultimately I think there's, um, I think like in AI and like language in particular, I think always the kind of goal of this whole hope to be able to like uh, understand other cultures and be able to converse with people um, kind of from like many different languages at the same time. Uh, so I think it's something that has been is kind of very, very core to like kind of research or like uh, curiosity. Um, and I think uh, I think it's encouraging that recently with these like larger scale models, I think we're now getting kind of to a point where we can actually see um, like practical improvements or where we can see like translate methods actually being uh, useful, yeah, to be used in practice uh, yes. in many languages. So, yeah. yeah, interesting. And we, we were just talking before and you already mentioned that, I mean, thousands of languages, uh, that means a long-term uh, project, right? Uh, so a lot to do. Are there any other questions in the audience? Yes, Sam. Thanks for your talk. Uh, do you have any idea how, the, like, how long the scale and the scale needed for these annotations and if any shortcuts exist? Like if certain things can be translated and then maybe there are some like cross-language translations that can be used to help scale things? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's a great, great question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, well, at this point, I think it's still kind of hard to, um, hard to estimate or hard to like s speculate what what is ultimately um, needed um, to like uh, to really completely fulfill on this like vision. I think the the best thing that we can we can do at this point is to um, kind of identify or prioritize the tasks that are most useful. Those are things like um, translation, like speech recognition or speech synthesis, and um, try to collect um, kind of high quality data for as many of these languages as we can. Um, 
and at the same time, so kind of this very dedicated task-driven um, data annotation combined with trying to leverage data that is already available that can be uh, learned from using semi supervised or unsupervised methods and combining these two different sets of um, kind of se sets of data um, to train uh, better models ultimately. So I think yeah, we both need uh, to work on the data annotation side, but also in terms of like learning from from more uh, yeah from existing available data and trying to make that more useful. Great, thank you. Another one? Yes, you're in the middle. Of course, for many applications, one is needing something like common sense. Mm -hmm. So now you just have language and it has imagination as it was. So have you kind of figured out how to put the common sense in? <laughs> Yes, yeah, I think a common, yeah. <laughs> common sense, as I think, as uh, like Hans mentioned also in his talk, is I think a, a big, uh, big research area and a big research direction in the in the general community. Um, I think it's something that, uh, like, if you had asked me like five five years ago, looking at uh, what these um, recent models can do, they actually are already able to exhibit uh, like aspects of certain sense that I wouldn't have, um, uh, of common sense that I wouldn't have expected them to have like five years ago. Um, so I think even without explicitly including uh, certain, uh, certain common sense of world knowledge, these models are yeah, able to do surprisingly well on things that we previously considered to require common sense for solving them. Um, but of course, uh, there's uh, many different forms of reasoning that these models still cannot do, or particularly when it comes to capturing uh, kind of things that are implicit Explicitly represented and not explicitly mentioned in in text or data, these are things uh, still things that these models have a hard time and struggle with, and oh, yeah, th that still requires I think a lot of a lot of methodology or uh, trying to think and design ways to actually um, make them perform better or incorporate this knowledge in some way into these models. Um, yeah, I think you, you will still be here a bit, right? Oh, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> for, for further questions. Uh, so thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, like to take this one. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So big applause to Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs>